Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. I am excited to continue the Iowa History 101 webinar series today, focusing on Iowa's long and proud history of farming corn. The Iowa History 101 series takes place on the second and fourth Thursdays through August as we share the stories about the past lives of Iowans. Please refer to our website, iowaculture.gov history, to learn more about this series and our other virtual programs, including the upcoming webinar tomorrow on May 29, in partnership with Iowa PBS, addressing the Carrie Chapman Cat Warrior for Women documentary. Tim Lane, Carrie Chapman Cat's great, great nephew, and Laura Bauer, documentary producer from Iowa PBS, will be presenters. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of, the, of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm happy to introduce our speaker, State Curator Leo Landis. Leo has a bachelor, Bachelor's of Science in History from Iowa State University and a Master's of Arts in Historical Administration from Eastern Illinois University. He has completed all but, his, all but his dissertation towards a PhD in History from Iowa State. His museum experience includes time at Living History Farms in Urbandale, Connor Prairie in Fishers, Indiana, and eight years as curator at, at the Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. He also, works, he also worked as a curator and director of education at Salisbury House in Des Moines. Now I'm very happy to turn, to turn it over to Leo to begin the webinar. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you everyone for joining us today. And as Jennifer said, we're gonna talk about corn farming in Iowa and really gonna focus on the horse drawn era today up through the uh, early 19 teens. And so we'll talk about what is corn, and how corn is grown, the processes that were used by the first and later generations of European uh, and Anglo-American uh, settlers in Iowa, and then how corn has been harvested in our state at different times in that period, and then how corn was stored. So those are our topics for the day. And uh, I don't know that I'll be able to do this for every talk, but you occasionally get an inset image of me uh, we did on the last program on baseball. That's me in 1986 on the uh, double shovel cultivator with Mary Schmidt of Living History Farms as well at the 1850 farm at Living History Farms, my first year of museum work. I really love primary sources. That's what, one of the things I love about being a historian. And uh, one of the sources we have on farming in Iowa was in the era before the United States Department of Agriculture, which President Lincoln established in the 1860s, the United States Patent Office was the predecessor and covered a lot of agricultural developments and did surveys through the 1850s of farm conditions. And so uh, having one of those great 19th century names is Admiral B. Miller and Joseph Brobst of Knoxville in Marion County. So just a little southeast of Des Moines. And Admiral Miller's middle name was Bird, so he was Admiral Bird Miller. And uh, they submitted the information about corn saying, and this is 1854, corn is the principal crop in this state. The average yield is about 60 bushels to the acre, present value 25 cents a bushel. The manner of bringing our prairies into cultivation is to break up the sod with a strong team of four or five yoke of cattle. This is generally done in June at the expense of about $2 per acre. Corn is planted by being dropped in the furrows after the plow and covered by the succeeding furrow slice. This crop is called sod corn and commonly produces about 25 bushels to the acre. Nothing is done to the corn after planting until ready to harvest. This first crop will generally pay the expense of breaking up the prairie lands. So uh, most farmers were putting in maybe five to 10 acres of, of corn their first season, farm families working together. 
uh, might be a farm wife or a child of the family following behind to plant the corn. And then just as a contemporary reference uh, for Iowa, corn for grain production in Iowa for 2019 is estimated at 2.58 billion bushels, according to the United States Department of Agriculture. Current year production is 3% more than the previous year's 2.50 billion bushels. Iowa has led the nation in corn production for the last 26 consecutive years and 41 of the last 42 years. Iowa's corn for grain yield is estimated at 198 bushels per acre. So almost uh, really four, close to four, three to four times what, what was estimated in 1854. And then the area harvested for grain is 13.1 million acres, 300,000 acres above 2018. Corn planted for all purposes in 2019 is estimated at 13.5 million acres. So that's where we are today. Uh, and, and so we'll talk about how did, how did that come to be. As we talk about what is corn, corn is a grass, the genus and species or the scientific name is Zia maize, M-A-Y-S, but uh, when it's spelled in a common form, it's maize, M-A-I-Z-E. -E. It was domesticated by native peoples of present day Mexico, just south of the Mexico City area uh, about 7,000 years ago. And the earliest production that, that we've been able to determine is about 1,200 years ago by woodland cultures or woodland peoples, the people who were the predecessors to the many native nations of uh, the Midwest of today. So that's, that's a little bit of background on what corn is and, and how it came to be in Iowa at first and, and wanted to recognize really it's the only indigenous grain crop that is, is grown in the United States or uh, for the most part in, in uh, North America. So corn has different types. And we'll talk about the type of corn that's grown in Iowa today, but the types of corn, and this is what's on the slide on the left there, is pod corn is the first corn. Each seed on that ear has a little husk around it. And so that was a type that was grown in some cultures was pod corn. And then popcorn, we all know what it likes. It looks like, uh, at least many of us, I should say, maybe there's somebody who doesn't know what popcorn looks like, but there's an ear of popcorn there, second from the left, and usually a smaller ear and uh, <clears throat> slightly pointed even on the, on the tips. The third corn from the left is a type called flint corn. It's a hard rounded ear, excuse me, yeah, hard rounded ear, but also uh, long and more cylindrical than, than round, actually. And the rows would be usually somewhere around eight to 12 uh, ear or rows of kernels on flint corn. It was high, uh, a dry uh, corn, good for grinding, and so uh, was typical in New England. It was a shorter season corn, and so native peoples of New England often raised flint corn. The Fourth corn from the left is dent corn. The dent corn is characterized by the kernels themselves having a slight impression. And so it is dented on the kernel itself. Uh, the next corn over then is flower corn. Then the last corn depicted is sweet corn. And that's a dry ear of sweet corn. It looks like a, a red variety. Uh, red varieties were not uncommon in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So if it doesn't look like the sweet corn you're used to seeing at the store, it's because that, that is a dry ear of sweet corn. The two corns that we really care about and, and that are the corn that makes the Midwest the Corn Belt are the flint corn and the dent corn cross. And so that's why on the right side image, those two uh, depictions of the, the flint corn and the dent corn is those two varieties cross with people from the South and people from New England and the North bringing their corns together. All of these corns can cross pollinate. And that is what became the common corn type of Iowa and the Midwest through the 1860s and 1870s. If you were a New Englander who had come to Iowa, you might start growing flint corn because that's what you knew and you might have brought that seed with you, but you usually converted over to that cross of a, a dent style corn uh, 
It would take somewhere around 100 to 120 days to mature, but our growing season is typically that long in Iowa. And so the southern dent corn uh, style is what became predominant, but it sometimes had, had crossed over with a flint variety as well. So when it comes to growing corn, I want to talk about how uh, you select seeds, plowing, planting, and planting, and actually there's a couple of processes in there too called marking, and you might harrow and then mark or uh, something to that, so we'll talk about that, and then how corn was cultivated. And that was that first image of me, we were cultivating corn in that photo. When it comes to selecting seed, and a reference I'll be using a lot is William Savage, who was in Henry County. Uh, he, he was from the Quaker settlement of Salem area. Uh, we have some artwork he did, but also his diaries that he kept. And the Annals of Iowa reprinted those in, in the 1930s. And so we have good records on how he farmed in Southeast Iowa down in Henry County. And on August 28th, he talks about husking corn, shell it and took it took to mill and gather seed corn, took it and cobs up to Samuels. Samuels uh, were neighbors of his and presumably had a, a place where he could store his seed corn where it wouldn't uh, be damaged by pests and he felt like that was a safe place to keep his seed corn. And so today, whereas farmers will buy seed from a seed company like Corteva, uh, Pioneer Hybrids successor company, uh, farmers saved their seed really through the 1930s uh, as the way to get their corn crop. So they would select ears that from the previous year that they thought looked good and thought that that would give them similar looking ears in the next season. There's so much genetic variety in corn that actually doesn't work that way. But again, to somebody, uh, even most of us who, who didn't realize there was that degree of genetic diversity, you might just say, oh, a good looking ear of corn is all those seeds are gonna produce similarly good looking ears of corn. And so that was how farmers saved their seed. They might braid the husks together uh, and let it dry hanging from rafters. Sometimes they'd use twine to tie ears uh, together and, and let them hang. You wanted them to dry evenly and be secure from pests because that was going to be your next year's seed corn. So selecting seed came from your previous year's crop. One of my favorite artworks uh, or works of art is by Francis William Edmonds. It's called The Speculator, but the gentleman there is shelling some flint corn. If you're able to uh, look at this, it's in the Smithsonian American Art Museum's collection. So it's online and you can get a really nice image of it. But uh, those are ears of flint corn that he is shelling and he's presumably doing what William Savage was talking about. He's either shelling it to take to the mill because he doesn't have a mechanical corn sheller. And so he's shelling by hand or it could be what he is shelling out, it's dried and he's going to put it into a, a secure jar or crock some way to keep it from pests. And so that's a, a good example of farmers hand shelling corn uh, in this piece of this work of art by Francis Edmonds. So going back to a diary entry by William Savage and in May of 1863, Savage makes the following notes. J. Wright plowed for me. I carried some of my fodder off. P.M. plowed with old kit. So we're presuming old kit is a horse. Marked off with her and planted some corn. Sunday, R. Wells and I to creek. Catch a good mess of fish. Dip net. 18th. Finished marking out and planted some beans, corn, and potatoes. 19th. Finished planting said ground that was plowed and grub some. So plowing was typically done after the ground had thawed, thawed excuse me, in Iowa. So that would be early April into early May, mid-May. And then if you were plowing prairie, it was as we talked about in that early account with A.B. Miller saying, you know, it would be four or five teams of oxen. But once the ground had been plowed, if you were just running 
a few inches deep and it would have been previously plowed, then you could use a single horse. And so <clears throat> uh, Savage is talking about plowing with uh, 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 an, old, an old horse named Kit. And then marking, and I'll show you some images a little later, is how farmers in the pre-herbicide pre days uh, were able to cultivate their corn in two directions. So you marked your field, and I'll show you some examples of what that would have looked like. And uh, he's probably marking with, with a plow. Uh, that's what he's talking about uh, in that, that account when he says that he marked off with her. He's probably still, he's plowed it. He may have harrowed the ground, which we'll talk about, to even it out, and then he marked it. And that was how you knew where to drop your seeds. So plows of the 1850s into the 1860s looked a lot like that Ames plow on the lower left. And when you're talking about plows, so now we're gonna do a little bit of agricultural technology 101. The two main working parts of the plow are the share, which is depicted there on the lower uh, center showing the, the cutting part of the plow. So that cuts into the soil. It would have a sharpened steel edge. And even in the 1830s and 1840s, as farmers were coming to the Midwest, they were starting to salvage steel shares and create that. And then the next part is the mold board. And the mold board is where the soil, the mold, slides up and is turned over and buries the stubble. And those are the two main parts of the plow. And so preparing the soil, you'd cut it and then turn it over with, with the plow, uh, the mold board doing that work. And so last talk when we were discussing the history of baseball, I said, um, you know, if you ever heard Abner Doubleday invented baseball, forget that. Well, if you ever heard that John Deere invented the steel plow, uh, it's a great company. So we've got some great Iowa businesses for, for John Deere, but John Deere did not invent the steel plow. A man named John Lane invented the steel plow. Another Illinois, Illinois blacksmith, John Lane, sorry about that mispronunciation on Illinois. Uh, John Lane is credited with developing the, the first steel plow. And it's just John Deere did a really good job with his steel plow. So he gets credit for bringing the steel plow to the world, but he did not invent the steel plow. That Ames plow, even though it's an 1893 plow, it's a style called an Eagle plow. That was around in the Midwest in the 18, late 1840s. It actually came out of New England and was around in the 1840s and the 1850s in the Midwest. And then uh, up above is a, another style of plow. Uh, David Bradley Company, First and Bradley, were out of Chicago. Uh, they made a, a really good, good set of plows too. So uh, Oliver, it was another popular maker, but there were dozens of plow companies across the Midwest. And as an example of a breaking plow, that beam is about 10 to 12 feet long. So the beam is the long wooden section. And then the share is a fairly long share and a mold board with that style of plow used by the Howell family in Madison County, they often hired themselves out to break prairie for neighbors too. So not every farm family had one of these style of plows. You would hire whoever had one and had the number of oxen to do that work. So this is a breaking plow in the collection of the State Historical Museum and was used in Madison County, just a little southwest of Des Moines, our, our neighboring county to the southwest. So. That's the, the type of plow that was being used to break the prairie. There's a great uh, Grant Wood uh, directed mural at the Parks Library at Iowa State that shows breaking prairie. And so if you wanna see an example of, of an artistic rendition, it's, it's idealized, but it's a, a really great work of art that's at the Parks Library at Iowa State. And usually it would cost, as, as Admiral Miller said, about $2 or $2 to $4 per acre to break prairie using a plow of this type. Another style of plow, and, and it often could be used to stir the soil, often used in either what's called plowing corn or in marking the field, are shovel plows. So uh, there's a song by Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys uh, called 
uh, stay a little longer. And he, uh, the line is, I plow my corn with a double shovel. Well, that's what the plow on the top is, is a double shovel uh, plow used for uh, generally removing weeds, but could be used to stir the soil. Not so much used that way in Iowa, but used uh, as a weed remover. Same with the single shovel, uh, wood beam single shovel plow there on the bottom image. And those could be used also to mark the field, especially that single shovel. Uh, you'd have your horse either pull the mold board plow like I showed on the previous slide, uh, from Bradley and, and Ames, or could mark it using a shovel plow like this if, if you didn't have a mold board plow and were borrowing one, but you did have a shovel plow. So if you ever see the term shovel plow, these are the styles of plows that were being used in the 1840s and 1850s into the 1870s, actually. And as you can see, David Bradley, they were popular enough that he was selling, their, that company was selling them into the 1880s and 1890s, and you see them in Sears and Roebuck catalogs as well. After a field was plowed, usually to break up the clods of dirt, if it was you know, old, old ground, previously farmed ground, uh, you would take a harrow through the field pulled by a team of oxen or a team of horses, and having metal teeth, uh, it would break up the clods of dirt and help level out the soil so that you then could mark it, uh, mark the soil with either a, a shovel plow or a corn marker. And we are, we're about to talk about corn markers and what, what those are. But these two types of harrows, again, from Ames Manufacturing Company with an 1893 catalog, but they're actually a style, again, that goes back to the 1830s and 1840s. Both of these style of harrows were really basic styles of harrows used to break clods of dirt after plowing, preparing the field for planting. So I've used that term marking. We talked about it with William Savage. Marking was the way to lay out your field, 40 inch rows typically, going the length of the field, but also by marking it, you'd go perpendicular to the rows you'd mark the length and you'd go perpendicular 40 inches, and the, at the intersection of those 40 inches is where you'd plant your seeds. And so here's an 1863 account of an uh, Iowa corn marker and saying, Iowa is well adapted to the cultivation of corn, yet many are so careless that weeds often get the mastery. Hence, they get a poor remuneration for their hard toil. One great reason is that after fitting the land for seeding, they spend several days in furrowing each way. That's using either the mold board plow or a shovel plow, jogging along in a zigzag manner so crooked that crows can hardly find the rows after it comes up. This requires much labor and is of no benefit except to in making easy planting. So saying it's easier to plant this way, but it really isn't uh, the smart way to do it. The corn is placed too deep to feel the warmth of the sun when it needs it most, and the farmer has to wait too long for the corn to get large enough to keep from covering it up the first time through, the first time through with the plow or cultivator. Corn needs light, air, and warmth to vegetate and grow rapidly. So I'm not gonna read the rest of that until we get to how to make a corn marker about two sentences down. It says, take two hardwood poles or scantling, that was a term that got used for lumber uh, often in the 1840s, so if you ever see scantling, it just means lumber. 14 feet long, lay them parallel and pin them at right angles four blocks, two feet long and two inches thick at a distance of three and a half feet apart. And I'll show you a, a similar item in a minute. But what it means is you've got uh, two parallel 14 feet long pieces of two by four or thereabouts, and then pinned together with what become runners that are 40 inches apart. And so you then fasten a tongue, that's the wooden beam that comes off of a wagon or any kind of implement uh, that then let, lets you pull it with a team of, steer it, I should say, with a team of horses. Usually there's a, a hitch on the back also, but the tongue is for steering the direction you wanna go. And it says, then the marker is complete. So it's, uh, you then hitch on your horses, take your place on the center of the marker, 
and drive on until the field is marked in one direction, then cross mark in the same way. Uh, stakes should be set at each end of the field of the lot to guide by instead of merely trying to run parallel with the last mark. 15 acres can thus be marked each way in a day. And CJ Rhodes really uh, was a farmer in Tama County. I looked him up in the uh, agri agri or in the population census, I should say, of 1860. So uh, he's a, a legitimate uh, correspondent. He was, to the American agriculturist, it was initially sent, and that was a national publication out of New York, I believe, for farmers. And then the Muscatine Weekly Journal picked up that American agriculturist uh, pub, uh, published note from C.J. Rhodes and ran it in the local paper. So there's an example of what a corn marker does. It marks parallel rows and you then go uh, perpendicular to those and every 40 uh, inches there's gonna be an intersection and that's where you plant your hill of corn. So on the, this is a patent from uh, Man in Lagrange. I think Lagrange is Fayette. Or I know it says there. It's Lucas. I knew it was uh, uh, not Fayette, so I had to check. So he's in Lucas County, so south central Iowa. And the <clears throat> depiction on the right, upper right, is an overhead or a plan view. And so those two V's in the back, those are actually the handles that the man uh, or woman who are steering the marker have, but you can see there are four uh, shoes or four attachments. Those are 40 inches apart. A horse and the tongue would be that area that's marked G coming off the uh, marker at the uh, lower center of the, the marker design itself. And so I don't know that this is uh, a wildly popular marker, but it's quite similar to what was described by the Tama farmer, C.J. Rhodes. So Iowa farmers were filing patents for styles of corn markers. And so there's a, a little shoe there on, on that it says that it'll, it'll have a, a form, I say shoe, a curved front is what I mean when I say that. So the, the four connecting bars, the shorter pieces of wood are what do the actual marking. Uh, Wanted to reference uh, one of my other favorite discussions of, of planting. And here's one of John Kenyon, who was a Delaware County farmer, talking on June 20th, 1859. So by today's standards, that's very late planting. But he wrote back home to some family back east saying, I have planted about 20 acres of corn and seven or eight of small grain. I finished planting corn yesterday, rather late to plant on the sod. And so he is planting on June 19th is when he finishes up on the 20 acres of corn. Uh, they had come to Iowa from New England uh, or, or a mid-Atlantic state and he and his wife, Sarah, were farming in Delaware County. In the crop report that came out this week, so late May, it was Iowa farmers have planted 97% of the expected corn crop three weeks ahead of schedule, or three weeks ahead of last year, excuse me, and almost two weeks ahead of the five-year average. So uh, that's a little bit of comparison and contrast. Farmers, Kenyon was probably a little worried about that. In fact, he worried a lot, but uh, he, uh, he doesn't sound too urgent. Just in planting as well, the, uh, Horse-drawn planters were coming in. This is an example in the museum collection. Uh, inventor farmer out of Galesburg, Illinois, David uh, Brown, I believe, or uh, Brown was the, the last name anyway. The Brown corn planter was really the first successful horse-drawn corn planter for the Midwest. And so it has two runners. You would have marked your field one direction, uh, either with a, a marker or perhaps with the planter itself and then gone perpendicular. And you can see these horse-drawn corn planters have uh, two, a, a driver, and then a man sitting on a small little stool next to seed boxes. And so the seed boxes are on the uh, edge on the right-hand photo, uh, and there's that circular disc. That's the seat for the man 
operating a lever that drops three to six seeds. It was usually around four to five seeds per hill. So farmers are planting in hills at this time in rows going the length and the width of the field. And the rhyme that uh, there's the phrase that's still around amongst older people, two to grow, that is actually part of a, a little couplet on teaching children how to plant corn. And it was one for the blackbird, one for the crow, uh, one for the ground squirrel, and two to grow, or a variation on that. And so the phrase two to grow actually comes from corn planting, and that was one that was around in the 1840s as Iowa was being settled. So if you were hand planting or using a horse-drawn planter, about four to five seeds per hill as you planted the corn. The next process that gets used after the corn is starting to grow in late June or early July is what we would call cultivating mostly, but often was called plowing in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, and, and even into the 1880s. And here's a Bradley horse-drawn cultivator. It has two sets of double shovels. It's essentially a, a four-shovel cultivator. That U-shaped bracket in the middle would straddle a row of corn, or would go over a row of corn. The horses would walk on each side of that row, and so you'd have a horse on your left of the the uh, U-shaped up down upside down U-shaped bracket. One horse would be on the left of that, walking in a between in a row or between rows, and the other horse would be walking between the other rows uh, on the right side, and then the operator would be holding the two handles, guiding the cultivator. So that way you could cultivate two rows at a time, not just one row like you would with a, a double shovel plow. So these styles of cultivators were coming in in the 1850s and 60s, uh, really popular in the 1860s and 1870s. And uh, one of my favorite historians did an excellent book called From Prairie to Corn Belt. Uh, his name is Alan Bogue. Uh, he did uh, a section talking about getting to farm, sitting down, and this is really the revolution that happens for Iowa farmers after the Civil War, and you don't have to walk the field. So again, it's essentially two double shovel cultivators, and it has the uh, tongue is the center beam coming off the front. There are two uh, what are called single trees, which become a double tree that you hitch the horses to. But here's a riding cultivator showing what farmers were using in the 1870s and 1880s in Iowa and into the early 1900s. You know, until herbicide is developed, farmers across the state are using cultivators to do weed removal. So this is a common style of implement. Uh, later drawn with a tractor mounted uh, cultivator used into the 1940s. And as I said, this was often called plowing corn. So if you're looking at diaries or letters, uh, some sort of correspondence of the 1850s and 1860s, and it's June, late June, early July, and you see a farmer talking about plowing corn, what they mean is weed removal. And so William Savage writes in June, on the 22nd saying uh, he worked on one of his boots, so half sole, one of my boots, plow in my corn. June 23rd, plow corn. June 24th, plow corn and went to Conley's. June 25th, plow corn. June 26th, plow corn. That was all the corn plowing he mentioned. Often farmers tried to get through their field at least once, uh, generally twice, and be done by 4th of July. And part of that is if you're using a walking cultivator as the corn starts to get higher, you're gonna knock it down if you've got a double row cultivator, or the horses are gonna be more inclined to try to eat the corn uh, leaves as it gets taller. So you were trying to, the, the term was often called lay by your corn by the 4th of July. So that idea of knee high by 4th of July didn't uh, hold water even back in the 1860s and 1870s. You hoped your corn was bigger by that time. And here's a really great example of what that marked field looked like. Uh, it's a farm residence in Butler County, so northeast, east central Iowa. And 
the farmer there, and I'll, I'll, I'll blow this up for you. There, the next photo will be an inset of it, but he is on a riding cultivator. And if you look at that cornfield, those are planted in hills with uh, generally, and again, it's slightly idealized on the cornfield, but there probably were gonna be two to four plants you hoped in each hill. And Iowa, where we get more than 30 inches of rain uh, in a growing season or uh, thereabouts, more than 20 inches of rain in a growing season often, uh, 30, more than 30 in a year, you can plant corn that way and it let you then cultivate the length of the field and the width of the field, thus having rows, uh, the length and width. So that's what that marked field let you do. It means you may not get the same level of productivity that we have today because the corn isn't as densely spaced and it isn't hybridized, but uh, that's what a riding cultivator would do. So he is plowing his corn, uh, presumably sometime in late June. And there you go. He's getting to farm sitting down as he plows his corn, much better than walking. Usually by mid-September, your corn was ready to harvest. And there were a couple of ways that Iowa farmers harvested their corn. Sometimes they shocked it and left it in the field. Sometimes they would shock it and then bring in the ears off the exterior part of the shock. And sometimes they would husk the corn and we'll talk about those as well. But here's William Savage again talking about uh, corn harvest of 1863 saying, I came home and commenced cutting corn, set up two shocks, went to I Conley's and partly made Walter a corn knife and stripped some cane. That's uh, sorghum uh, is what he's talking about and stripping some cane, uh, probably taking leaves off the sorghum to feed to cattle. And then on the 12th, a Saturday, he hunted in the morning. On the 13th, he went fox hunting in the morning. He shot one gray fox. On the 14th, he cut corn and set one shock, took one wheel up to Thornton's, hunt cows, so his cows must have been missing. Uh, 15th, he cuts corn, sets two shocks. 16th, set three shocks. Then I, Connolly, and I stacked my Hungarian hay, two loads, and his, and his six loads, and fix Walter's corn knife. So, uh, good example of, of uh, Iowa Diary talking about husking corn. And it was a idealized activity in New England because of the uh, changes in farming in Iowa, these sorts of idealized scenes of the 1850s and 1860s, the husking bee or the husking frolic is depicted in this Harper's Weekly uh, uh, engraving that appeared in Harper's Weekly. Uh, you've got people doing the work and husking out the corn. The reason why it was important if you were storing corn inside to husk it is if you, it was before the frosts, and if you left the husks on, the moisture in the corn would cause the corn to rot. So that's what you're doing when you're husking corn is you're pulling off the husk as it is mostly dry, but letting the corn finish its drying in storage. And the tradition was in, in New England that if you found a red ear, so a genetic variation, uh, you would get to kiss your sweetheart. And so in the foreground, you see one young man getting to kiss his sweetheart, and then on the uh, right center, uh, a young woman not real uh, excited about being kissed as a young man holds what one presumes is a red ear of corn. So this is the idea of a husking bee. They, they happened occasionally in Iowa, especially in the early settlement, but uh, not a major event. And this was where if the corn was cut into shocks, you would pull off the ears, bring them into a barn, and husk them out in a group setting as a social event and then could store the corn to feed out to your animals. And when you husk, you use two things. I, I came across in some of the research that I've done uh, a discussion of the best kinds of husking pegs in the 1840s and 50s. And one Iowa farm correspondent talks about a metal husking peg. So on the lower part is a wrought iron husking peg. So the typical metal that blacksmiths were using in the period. Uh, of the sort that would be used. Uh, and then a, a really basic wooden husking peg. Those let you slide under the husk of the corn and really slice it open so it's easier to remove that husk. So that's what a husking peg does. And then later in the 1800s, 1880s, 1890s, 
as productivity is increasing more and more and farm sizes are getting larger, though this is a depiction from Iowa County of an, uh, a farmer, he's a hired man uh, harvesting corn, he's probably using something like that hook that's uh, depicted on the right that mounts over your palm with the leather strap below the metal attachment wrapping around your wrist and then the leather strap going behind your uh, fingers between your middle or your little finger and, and the adjacent finger and then back over to the index finger and being secured to your palm and he's got on a pair of gloves it's uh, probably October or November when he's harvesting that and so this is the typical style of, of picking and husking that happened on most Iowa farms by the 1870s. The tying into shocks could be used for fodder, for chopping up and feeding to animals, but most farmers would husk the corn, throw it into a wagon, take it into a corn crib, and let it store that way. And that was typical from the 1860s into the uh, early 20th century into the 1950s, really. 1960s, 1970s, uh, you still would see a few wire cribs holding ear corn uh, if a farmer didn't have a combine from the 1940s. So picking and husking was typical. Uh, here's the style of, of knife that William Savage referenced. It's essentially a machete, uh, wrought iron blade, maybe a steel blade secured with a wooden handle and about 12 to 16 inch long metal blade and a six inch handle that's used to chop the corn at the base of the stalk at the ground and tie that into bundles in the field. So instead of having stalks standing, you'd tie them into bundles and stack them into what's called a shock, an upright group of about 40 to 60 uh, stalks of corn all tied together. If it was still a little green, that would keep it uh, healthy for or more palatable for cattle especially. And then developed by 1900 is a machine called a corn binder so that you didn't have to hand tie the bundles. Farmers were familiar with binders from harvesting wheat and oats, but inventors developed a corn binder that would tie it into bundles of about 10 to 20 stalks of corn. And then you could put those bundles together and tie a shock or you could take it into your your farmyard and chop it up and feed it to cattle. So corn binders were becoming more common on many Iowa farms. So this is from Northeast Iowa, Fayette County, uh, Arlington, Iowa, an ad for the Deering corn, corn binder. And corn cribs were the typical building for storing corn for Iowa farmers into the, really, as I said, into the 1950s in many cases until the combine uh, combines the processes of picking and shelling corn. And so here you see a farmyard uh, in Fremont County, so southwest Iowa. And in the right side of the uh, kind of center right is a man tossing ear corn out to hogs. And so here it is blown up. Uh, that's a, probably a wooden rail corn crib, uh, open top, uh, presuming that because really it's slatted, there's enough ventilation that if it gets wet in that crib, uh, it's not going to damage the corn. So having corn cribs near your hog lot was something that was uh, Im important. Corn is the main way to fatten your hogs. Cattle through the 1940s in Iowa generally were grazed for much of their life on grass and on pasture, but then were finished on corn, whereas hogs were eating corn year round. And there's another example of what became the common style of corn crib. This is a Fayette County farm, uh, again from the Andreas Atlas of 1875. So that's a typical corn crib style. And in fact, this coming from the Library of Congress is a Northwest Iowa farm with that style of corn crib. Usually it was off the ground a little bit. So you can see the log that makes the, the base of this or the lumber that makes the base of this crib is on rocks. If you look in the right side of that image of the crib and it's slatted, so ventilated. And that was a typical corn crib into the 1940s, 1950s. Uh, wire cribs became more common in the 1950s and 1960s. So this all started to change 
around 1910 with how Iowans farmed. The two big, big developments at that time are hybrid seed corn, and this is at the corner of 38th and Cottage Grove in Des Moines, where in 1908, excuse me, 1904, 15-year-old uh, year Henry A. Wallace was said to have started his first experiments in corn, and Henry A. Wallace goes on with Raymond Baker to found Pioneer Hybrid. It's uh, a style called double cross hybrid seed where you cross uh, two types of corn and then you cross them with another type and you get the double cross hybrid and that leads to much greater productivity. The double cross hybrid, you can't plant the seeds the next year because they don't give the same uh, production. But through the 1920s, 1930s, Iowa farmers maybe were up around 40 to 50 bushel per acre, maybe 60 in a good year, it could go better than that, but didn't see a lot of improvements. When hybrid seed corn comes in, the productivity really takes off. It's also helped by herbicide and fertilizer after World War II, and you really see production take off like we are at today with close to 200 bushel per acre on average. But uh, that idea of hybrid seed corn uh, was what transformed American agriculture. And so Henry A. Wallace got his experiments starting uh, as a boy. He learned from George Washington Carver about plants when uh, Wallace was a boy and his father taught at Iowa State. Both Henry C., his father, and Henry A. would be secretaries of agriculture. The other thing that really changes is also the tractor and the uh, idea of chemical farming and J.L. Anderson, Joseph Anderson, has a great book called Industrializing the Corn Belt that talks about how Iowa farming was transformed in that uh, tractor era into the 1970s. And so if you want a good resource, that's, that's a really great one is Joseph Anderson's book, J.L. Anderson, Industrializing the Corn Belt. But just looking, you know, it's not uncommon for Iowa farms to have 200 bushel per acre yields today. But as we wrap up, if you want to uh, get into corn farming today and, and get a planter. Well, you can get a used Kinsey planter made in Williamsburg, uh, Iowa for just $270,000, a little under that. Uh, but you can see it's a 36 row planter and the row spacing is now down to 20 uh, inches per row. And then if you're moving into harvesting, you can get the combine itself. This isn't the head, but a combine, a 2019 John Deere is about 409,000. Uh, these are this week's numbers, uh, so just about 410,000. And then, of course, if you're harvesting corn, you need a corn head. Uh, that's what mounts to the front of the combine to do the picking. And you can get a corn head that'll pick on a 18 rows that are 20 inch rows, uh, 109,000, uh, almost $110,000. And so uh, we're much more productive, but those are the challenges some Iowa farmers face today is you have to buy your seed and the equipment is uh, the, the cost of a really nice house. And so uh, we're grateful for the Iowa farm families who produce the corn that feeds our hogs and makes our ethanol. And uh, that's how we got to where we are today with you know, about uh, $800,000 just for the uh, <clears throat> planting and harvesting equipment. That doesn't count the sprayer or anything else. And with that, I'm wrapped up. And so thank you so much for being part of our, our program today. And want to remind you our next program is going to be June 11th on automobiles. Thank you, Leo. So we have some time for some questions. However, before I pose the first question, I want to remind our participants that you can still submit your questions through the Q&A feature uh, through the page here. Uh, we are on a schedule though, so please note we may not be able to get all the questions before the end of the webinar, but please continue to add questions in there. If you have any, I'll be checking it during this time. But here's our first question, Leo. Uh, so you mentioned a double shovel cultivator. How many shovels did the typical cultivator have and what was the max? And a second part of the question is, was there like a macho factor involved with the size of the cultivator a farmer could handle? Uh, I'll answer the second part first. I'm not aware, even with my own ego, I, I was just happy to get the work done. So. Uh, the typical riding cultivator or even walking cultivator would be four rows at a time. There may have been some farmer and I'm sure I, uh, Americans being the way we are, it's like, oh, let's see if I can make a six row or a six shovel cultivator that would do three rows at a time. Uh, 
But again, you, you need to have a degree of balance. And as you start to get more horses involved, it gets more and more complex keeping the horses in the row. So the standard was by 1870 that four shovel, two double shovels that would do two rows at a time. So uh, I don't, I've never seen in my, uh, you know, 20, 30 years of paying attention to this stuff, uh, a three row or six shovel cultivator. Uh, another question too is how many times in a season would they cultivate a field if things were ideal? Yeah, two times would be about what you'd need to do. Once as the corn had sprouted and you could see, and so you could dig out the weeds that way, maybe when the corn was about you know eight inches tall, and then by the time it was around 24 inches tall, a second time through, but as it gets closer to 24 or 30 inches tall, the corn's gonna start shading out the weeds. So if you could get through two times, that would be pretty good. Uh, some, you know, particularly fastidious farmer might try to get through three times. A question from Wayne uh, asked to uh, talk about when tractors replace horses, when did that happen? Um, and then what it happened specifically at that time? Sure. Iowa farmers start to experiment with tractors in the 19 teens. The first mass produced tractor is the Fordson and that's uh, released in 1917, but doesn't really become prominent until 1919. Then uh, another Iowa inventor working for uh, McCormick Deering or Watts International Harvester develops the uh, Farmall tractor and that transforms. It's a row crop tractor, so that helps. Uh, won't get into too much detail on what a row crop tractor is, but it means it could work in corn, it could plant, it could cultivate. Uh, Prior to that, tractors weren't really good at working between rows, but the farm all had uh, high wheels. And so then the John Deere B and the John Deere tractors become more and more common and popular. So those all happened through the 20s and 1930s. But in Iowa, it's not until I think the mid 50s where there are more tractors on Iowa farms than there are horses. So you see horses used on Iowa farms through the 19. 30s and 40s and 50s, but really the, the production we needed for World War II, that was a big catalyst for switching from horses to tractors. Plus the farmers who grew up using horses were aging out and new farmers coming in were saying, I don't want to deal with horses, I want a tractor. Eric, thank you. Uh, a question from Ronald uh, was about the distance and planting and he asked, wasn't 42 uh, more come than 40 inches? I, I know that by the 19, it, I should say the early 1900s, late 1890s that you did with, with mechanical planters, you did start to see uh, more 42 inch rows. Uh, I, I'll, I'm curious to go down now and measure our horse-drawn planter from the 1860s that's in our Civil War exhibit and see if those are 40 or 42 inch rows. But uh, I know Ron knows what he's talking about and uh, he's, he's correct. By 1900, 42 inch rows were, were more standard. Another question we had was, is popcorn any significant part of our Iowa economy? Or do you know what state uh, popcorn is a relatively major crop? Yeah, Iowa has had uh, a long significant history with popcorn. So. Uh, in eastern Iowa, Vinton area, so Benton County, uh, used to be a, a really uh, major popcorn producing area. In fact, uh, and this is no, no means an endorsement, but tiny but mighty uh, popcorn is out of Benton County. And then you've got Jolly Time and in uh, northwest Iowa out of Sioux City. So uh, western Iowa has had a strong popcorn industry as well. So uh, that's where farmers will always look for the niche where they think they can make the best profit and popcorn has been one where some farmers have said, hey, this is a uh, crop that I want to grow too. It, it does take a, you know, a different type of, of uh, you know, you don't run a combine through your, your popcorn field. Uh, and our last question is one I, I like to ask for each of our uh, webinars, but what sources do you use for your research? Yeah, uh, if you're looking for Midwestern Iowa farming. Alan Bogue, who I referenced as a secondary source from Prairie to Corn Belt, is uh, still the best. He was 
uh, professor at University of uh, Wisconsin Madison. And so, uh, as Jennifer may announce at the end too, we'll we'll send out a bibliography. There's also, uh, uh, as I referenced, Joseph Anderson's "Industrializing the Corn Belt" is a good one on uh, ninth or 20th century, especially that uh, 19 teens into the 1960s, 1970s period. So that's a, a good one. Uh, John Schleybecker, who uh, was a professor at Iowa State in the 1960s and then went to uh, the Smithsonian and was their curator of agriculture. He has a nice book called Whereby We Thrive. Doug Hurt uh, did a book. It's, all these are a little older, but they're still great sources. Uh, Anderson's is, is fairly new. Uh, but Doug Hurt from uh, now at University of Purdue, or Purdue University, he did a book on uh, farm technology from hand power to steam power that has some some great information in it too, if you're looking for uh, some basic material culture history. Uh, then uh, Annals of Iowa, our own publication has some great references as well. So we'll send out, we'll send out a list to all the participants. That's fantastic, thank you, Leo. Um, also, um, someone did mention a question about a library of our webinars. There, is, there will be a link in the email uh, sent to you about previous webinars that we've done as well. Um, but that this time, it, uh, it's all the time we have for today's webinar. So thank you again to Leo for leading our lecture this afternoon. I know I can say this has been a very informative lunch uh, once again. Also, thank you to everyone joining us today. We hope everyone can join us in the upcoming weeks and over this summer for future programs hosted by the State Historical Museum. The next webinar in this series will be on June 11th and will continue through August. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. For more information and to register for future webinars in this series, uh, check out our website at iowaculture.gov slash history. And while you're there, you can check in out some of our uh, fantastic digital programs, such as our weekly Goldie at Home activities for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Stories series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you for the next webinar right here on Zoom tomorrow on May 29th. Thank you. <laughs>